Hi, everyone. Mic works. Oh my god, success. OK, before we start, I have my lovely assistant there in the background. If you'd like to participate in this talk, I like audience participation very much. And get a souvenir, wave a hand, you'll get a little blowing thing, and we'll see how loud you can get. But no cheating during clapping. So, but a clap for my lovely assistant so he doesn't feel so awkward. Come on. Anyway. <laughs> Music instruments. Deal them around. Perfect. OK, we are on the go. So, what I'm doing here today is not going to be directly related to my research because I didn't think that you needed to hear all that all over again. The point of this is to learn something new. And what I can teach you, what I can talk to you about, not at you, to you, is about policies. That thing over there. Now, you might be wondering what the hell is going on here, but let's go from the beginning. Come on. Work, machine. Ugh. I have to be closer, don't I? There we go. So I like to-do lists, and I want to make it really simple. What I want you to think about, what I really want you to consider about nine minutes from now are two things. First one, is my research really making a difference? And the second one, can I use garbage to make the world a better place? Not necessarily related, but on the same to-do list. And I wanted to talk to you about this through the second quantum revolution. And if we have a little blowy things, now's the time. <laughs> Beautiful! That's what we want. Thank you very much. The second quantum revolution is a really big thing, not just for us who work and research, but for the world. And you can tell it's a really big thing because a lot of politicians have invested a lot of money into this. China has recently founded a national institution where they're siphoning about 10 billion US dollars. The US has a National Quantum Initiative Act, which is about a tenth of that. And we have the lovely quantum flagship in the EU, which is about the same level. You might be thinking, this is great, things are moving along. But you'd be wrong, in my opinion, don't quote me. Because alongside the EU quantum flagship, individual countries are investing money into national institutions instead of the US, which puts all its money into one pile and works on it together. Yeah, alarming, I know. <laughs> In the EU, all these countries and many others are uh, just shoving the money on the side instead of putting it all together in one little pile. Now, why would this be important? Because we have this timeline that I borrowed from the Boston Consulting Group, where we actually have no idea when this second quantum revolution will actually happen. It could be 10 years here, could be here, could, could be... We, we have no idea. That's because investing a lot of money is, comes with a lot of uncertainty. You can throw money here if you're China and expect that you're 10 times more likely to achieve something, but that may, may or may not happen. And if we put our little tinfoil hats on, which my lovely assistant made for me, we also have all these questions that we need to wonder about. What happens if somebody gets access to a quantum computer, can break RSA, doesn't tell anybody, nobody's worrying about this? What are the military applications of quantum communication? What other things could happen? Can we have a market monopoly by one company, for example, Microsoft or IBM or Google, and we can't do anything about that? But what I really want to talk about on this slide is the Human Genome Project. Hands up, who's heard of the Human Genome Project? Beautiful. Who's heard of the policy problems with the Human Genome Project? Couple of you, impressive. Why I want to talk to you about this thing is because it was a giant, international, multinational project to have an open access human genome completely solved. And what happened? In about the last 10% of the work, a lot of companies just kind of slided in and said, OK, great, we're going to use this open data and we're going to get to the end of the sequencing and then we're going to patent stuff. And only we will be able to use it. Nobody else, and we'll charge money, and we'll decide who gets to use it. This was thwarted by the president of the US, basically saying, that doesn't seem ethical. And I want everybody here to think about what if this happens with quantum computers? What if it happens that we think about this too late? I want you to think about it now. So the thing that I'm talking about is actually regulation of intellectual property rights. It's actually not a bad thing, it's a really good thing, because it correlates with innovation. So intellectual property rights 
if you have them stronger, which means that you get more patents, your patents are harder to break and so on, then companies and countries will invest more money and there will be more innovation, which is what we want, yay. But as a country, you think about if these property rights are too strong, then my public will get nothing out of it. We'll, we'll have no open science or very little of it. We won't have all this research that builds on top of each other. Super. So what regulation does is try to hit this balance between innovation and public goods. It's not necessarily that regulation is a bad thing. It can be a really good thing. It's been proven that it helps markets stay competitive and it brings more innovation in general the more we have it. So this is something fairly important, but it's part of a bigger question. Beer. We are in Bavaria, so let's talk about that. How does regulation affect beer? Is it highly regulated in Germany? All the ingredients have to be strictly determined. There's not a lot of experimentation that happens here. Some might say that's a bad thing, but at the same time, the Bavarian consumer gets high-quality beer, yeah? I don't see a lot of nods here. You can't come to Munich and do that. But it's a, it's a part of a question, which is public policy. And I've told you a bit about regulation, and when I wondered about this question, I imagined public policy is something that guys at law faculties with big books talked about. But it's actually not. If you had a house, and your house was your country, your state, your government, EU government, whatever, when you talk about public policy, what part of a house would you find it in? The roof? Windows? Yard? Kitchen? Any ideas? Walls painted on the side? No votes. Okay, it's a foreign topic, but we'll get to a better part of it. You'll find it in the trash. The garbage. Seriously, there is a theory in decision-making called the garbage can model, which says that, well, people make policies, you have all these activist groups, government groups, ministries, they write out what we think is a good idea to have, and then they give it to the ministries, to the governments. Here's my baby, here's my child, make the world a better place. And then the secretary takes it and goes, we have 20 of these from last month, and dumps them in the garbage. And when a problem happens, the minister goes into the garbage and says, what do we have on top? So that's the garbage can model, and this is a really simple way of dealing with decision-making in policies. But when you actually have a problem and you need to solve it, what I always ask myself whenever I can is, what would the Ghostbusters do? And what would the Ghostbusters do? Cross the beams. Cross the beams, or in this case, cross the streams. So you have three streams. One is the problem stream, which is something happened. There's public attention on this. We need to do something. The second one is, there is a policy. Somebody dumped a 300-page document into our garbage last week. Great. And the third one is politics. Politicians who are in power know what they're doing and know about this topic. And when these three things, these three streams come together, policy can change. In quantum perspectives, our problem here is mostly that the public has no idea what the problem is. The public has very little idea what a quantum computer is, what would be revolutionary about having one. And when something revolutionary does happen, will they understand the consequences or what's good or bad about it? Our politics stream, lovely, I'm going to have nightmares, um, is Trudeau, who is one of the rare politicians who was shown to be able to actually talk about quantum computers, which is extraordinary. And why? Because they have a lot of industry in Canada that relies on novel technologies, quantum technologies included. People have talked to him about this and told him, ha, huh, this is important, you're going to make some money out of this. Canada's going to be a good country. And the third one, which is the point of this whole debacle that I'm putting myself through, is you need to make noise. Noisemakers? <laughs> Perfect! <laughs> if you don't make noise, if you don't create policies and solutions, who will? So this is the handy-dandy table, which I'm sure you'll remember by the time you get home, is how policy control works. First, there's some investments that happen, be it monetary, be it time-wise, be it people working in different types of institutions, governmental, private, industry, doesn't matter. They make some results. These results are marketable, non-marketable. They can produce more research, basic, advanced, doesn't matter. 
they are a problem. Something's happened. As the problem arrives, people will be making policies on how to use these things. And politics will also make thick wind of, huh, we could make money on this. It's great. And these three things come together to form regulation, which in turn affects investments. But there's one thing that's more powerful than any of these, and that's hype. What I wanted you to think about is, is there anything you can do to increase hype as ex experts, as scientists, as people working in the research of quantum stuff. Because if you don't talk about this, who else will? And what will happen if they do? So my to-dos from nine minutes ago, I hope, or so, were start to talk, we did that, and now we're wondering, is my research making a difference? Well, you know, kind of, but we all know that papers on archive are, are taking kind of an exponential rise, and the chance of people reading your papers are taking an exponential fall. So maybe it is, maybe it isn't, you don't know. Investment is a big risk. You don't know what comes out of it. But if you want to make a difference now, or in 10 years from now, or 20, you can speak up. You can talk about this, you can make sure that your voice is heard. And the second one, can I use garbage to make the world a better place? I would say yes. Because whatever you do, whatever you say, whatever kind of mark you make in the world, maybe like me doing this science slam, it can be a masterpiece or it can be trash, but most of it will always end up in the garbage, and that's not always a bad thing. Thank you very much for the attention. Ivana Kuricic.